Hello and welcome to this session on Leadership for Sustainable and Equitable Society. I am Preeti Ahuja, CHRO at IntelliCap. Please join me in welcoming our industry experts and panel members, Pramod Kassad and Santosh Singh. Pramod Kassad is a Managing Director of Investment Banking at IntelliCap. Pramod is a leading catalyst of equitable development globally by supporting entrepreneurial intervention through the provision of risk capital. His key expertise are private equity syndication, mass financing for public and private companies. Pramod has almost three decades of experience in financial services world with firms like Citibank, Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, and Indusind Bank. Um, let's welcome Santosh Singh, who is our second panel member, Managing Director, Climate Solutions, Agriculture and Financial Services at IntelliCap. Santosh has more than 18 years of diverse experience in climate and sustainable development sectors. While he started his career in a corporate role and worked briefly, he switched to the development space. He worked as a researcher for think tanks, worked with multilaterals, bilaterals, and leading philanthropic foundations. As part of Sankalp Forum, this is primarily an effort to build awareness and bring to light the leadership gap that exists in this sector as compared to the enormous opportunities that are in front of us. During the course of this conversation with our panel members, our focus today will be to discuss emerging themes in this space and share insights on the leadership opportunities in the development sector. As we begin, I'd like to invite you to make this session as interactive as possible for a productive takeaway for each one of us. You may send in your questions in the chat box and we will try our best possible to address each one of them. I'd like to start with my first question to Pramod. Um, we're very keen to hear about your rise in the leadership space uh, in this sector. So can you talk a little bit about that? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So obviously, I was a career banker throughout before coming to Impact Platform. I worked with institutions which was global in nature, focused on commercial returns all the time. Their interest was to make commercial returns and there was no specific focus on impact or responsible investment per se. When I, a couple of years back, when I met Vineet, our founder for Avishkar Group, he kind of changed my perspective for the world. He suggested, why don't I explore the opportunity of joining the impact platform? which helps the organizations to grow and create a massive impact for human, humanity. That's where I decided to join Impact Platform. Interesting. So for someone from the mainstream industry, Pramod, what are some of the potential and best ways to transition to the sustainable investment sector, given your experience? So I suggest uh, youngsters who are empathy, towards humanity, who are, want to do something for society, should start focusing on the sectors which are more impactful in nature. Top of the mind, technology-enabled business and financial services, which are more in financial inclusion in nature, or there are healthcare technology companies or healthcare companies, or there are agri-technology companies. So there's a wide, I mean, wide vast of industries available to work on impact space rather than doing focus on real estate or thermal power, which are not technically the impact investments. So I suggest the youngsters can start focusing on these variety of verticals which are more impactful to choose their career path. Great. Uh, Santosh, my next question would be to you. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your leadership journey in this space and also throw some light on key differences between working in the impact sector versus the mainstream sector. So Priti, you know, I briefly dabbled with the corporate sector and then I have been working all my life for the uh, development sector. Um, but I don't kind of differentiate between uh, these sectors as mainstream or development sector. I see this as a way to create value for society. So I started my career as a, you know, a commodity trader in West Africa, uh, selling agriculture commodities from West Africa to Europe. Uh, that was a very different part of uh, uh, kind of my life. Uh, but then I graduated to a role where I learned about the development sector nuances by working with some of the leading economists and the practitioners of this space. But the idea was to gain more knowledge, more nuances. And I was working with a think tank. 
then uh, you know graduated to uh, a role where i was advising governments in a bilateral uh, form um, you know which was working on the energy access and financing renewable energy so uh, the role was more to apply the understanding of finance behavior change and the policies to kind of enable some change in many of the programs that uh, ministry of new and renewable energy was running uh, and then i moved to another uh, you know multilateral world bank and then to indelicap so my journey primarily has been about uh, being passionate about a few causes that i have been since uh, you know my early days and then trying to you know see how i can create impact in that and and in that quest i have been looking at different levers be the lever of finance behavior change policy or or enterprises and that's uh, you know uh, kind of so slightly different take than what pramod has been doing pramod has been kind of more into looking at one function and using that as a lever i have been looking at the cause and trying to find out levers to change that so slightly uh, different approach but uh, this also reflects into uh, today's kind of uh, a scenario where you can pick up your expertise or your kind of passion and create a, a pathway in the leadership space interesting so you've been a leader in this practice for fairly long time what do you think are the opportunities that exist in this sector for someone who would be interested and what type of profiles are the most ideal fit in this industry see i think uh, you know the lines uh, between the mainstream and development sector uh, you know are blurring uh you know when i say typically in any industry there are three kinds of role you build or manufacture something you provide some kind of service or you finance or invest in these kind of things right there are only three things you can see all the three things uh, are very much applicable to development space as well now one hallmark of development space is that the priority the kind of urgency uh, over different themes has been changing and if you look at that climate is a very very hot topic and when i said about climate is a big bucket within the climate there are many opportunities coming but one key thing that is coming in the climate is that how you can reduce the emission to go out from uh, you know our activities so looking at the mitigation which is i'm just simplifying that how to kind of not pollute the world and the second one is that if the world is getting heated how to kind of uh, be more resilient and adapt to that that's the that's it now in order to do that you are again going back to the three things you are building manufacturing creating solutions you are providing some kind of services or you are investing in them so if you have expertise in any of these three areas you can directly you know move into a development or climate role but now coming specific to the question that you had while the broad uh, you know development agenda climate is probably the now the biggest uh, you know category that is getting all the attention but within that in the climate there are roles which are into climate finance where you are looking at financing the climate solutions uh, just to give you a sense where we talk when i talk about the climate finance many many kind of estimations have been done that how much money we require to move from the status quo to where we want to go which is the more desirable pathway for climate change and the numbers goes into trillions you are talking about 3 trillion 4 trillion 5 trillion depending on which estimate you are looking at now this kind of money is not going to be automatically flowing in so you need to find out a way how we can go to the transition how we can bring them in so climate finance becomes one critical area second there is a lot of focus on providing innovative solutions to a number of challenges we are facing how we can produce without emitting much how we can capture the carbon and reduce the carbon from the environment how we can make the businesses uh, become more carbon neutral now these are the sectors where a lot of opportunities are coming third in the sector where we are talking about a number of uh, ecosystem building that we call or or uh, you know interventions in the policy interventions in the uh, you know kind of regulatory affairs all are emerging so within this lots of functions lots of i would say that those who are kind of uh, looking for development sector career they need to assess that what excites them most mm -hmm. uh, if they have a finance skill can they apply finance skill to development challenges if they are brilliant at building solutions can they build solution for climate if they are brilliant at kind of you know making nuances doing research doing kind of knowledge building they can do that so uh, i can elaborate on the sectors later but i think these are the kind of main uh, themes that are emerging right now in the development and climate space uh, we are talking about well looks like there are humongous opportunities in this space um from what are the top 5 skills needed and um you know any any kind of road map that you can adopt 
to rise as an expert in the impact investment sector. You're on mute, Pramod. Yeah, sorry. So when you talk about impact investment banking, it's all about high salaries and great perks, which makes this uh, career very attractive for both recent graduates as well as experienced finance professionals. So obviously, the market is very competitive. And hence, there are very specific qualities the investment banks look for among the incoming candidates. I would say most important is analytical skills. Investment bankers are supposed to present detailed analysis of businesses and investment plans to highly demanding investors or clients. Hence, analytical skills, very important skill. Second, I would say communication skills. The primary job of a banker is to pursue and convince the client and sell the idea to all around investors. Presentation skills, documentation, slideshows, spreadsheets, you need to have very good skills to make these good documents. Third, mm -hmm. I would say management and leadership ability. So when investment banker starts as a junior analyst, Candidates are assessed on long-term potential. In the short to mid-term, they are assigned complete ownership of business opportunity, eventually followed by the assignment on their own. Down the line, they may become vice president above leading business divisions. Even in an entry-level position, candidates are required to take responsibility, build teams, seek assistance from across multiple internal divisions, and build partnerships with external vendors and partners. Hence, management and leadership potential is an integral part of investment banking job. Fourth, very important point I keep highlighting to all the candidates is about entrepreneurial skills. Investment banking is a key player in mergers and acquisition deals, corporate financing, IPOs, and new business capitalizations. The ability to identify business opportunities in new and unusual areas is a requirement of the investment banking job. It may involve funding a team of enthusiasts to help them build a business from scratch or spotting growth potential in an existing business. Another important point for youngsters, networking skills. Investment bankers need ability to make connections with people from many industries and various cultures. Candidates should demonstrate the ability to deal with unfamiliar situations and maintain healthy client relationships. Other few skills are Empathy, loyalty, another very important is high ethical standards. These are the key skills we would look for in incoming investment bankers profile. Great. Thanks, Ramod. Um, coming back to you, Santosh, uh, you know, within the larger bucket of climate sector, you did touch upon climate finance, but could you help us demystify some of the emerging terms like carbon markets, ESG, blended finance, and nature-based solu based solutions? Yeah, so I think uh, I just, you know, I was hinting at that, that when you look at the climate, uh, there are two types of activities. One, to kind of let the world not get more pollution, you know, coming out from different activities. And second is that to kind of work. And now, these themes are, uh, you know, kind of getting into many manifestations of different areas. So ESG is one way of saying that corporate need to play a bigger role in the sustainable development. And, and the way they have been interacting is not enough they need to do more now esg is a very hot topic primarily because a large number of corporates would start moving towards the new esg frameworks to start looking at the business aid society and governance parameters in a very very different way so within esg i think uh, uh, there are three kind of roles emerging one is uh, esg reporting and as you say that most of the corporates have started talking about preparing their esg reports along with the audit reports, which are kind of an annual affair and everybody is looking for the human resources in that. The second one is that when you start looking at, at the investors who are saying that we'll start investing, uh, you know, as per the ESG sectors norm, as per the ESG dimension. So ESG investing is the second bucket that is there. Third is looking at the ESG implementation. So you need to kind of achieve those goals that you want to report on, right? Now, these areas have kind of, uh, 
you know emerge very very rapidly and there is a huge huge uh, crisis of human resources there especially if you look at the esg uh, you know implementation side of that if you if i have to kind of put into that the skill set that is missing right now is more on the esg implementation people who are kind of uh, good with awareness of the topics can do the reports but awareness of biodiversity loss versus biodiversity conservation is very different ball game right mm -hmm. so esg is one area second is the area of nature based solutions is technically saying that we need to preserve our nature better to kind of create value so you are talking about nature as a way to conserve carbon to create more value for society and and again in this sector you are looking at enterprises which are trying to finance these solutions trying to do the solution themselves or kind of provide the support services to that carbon markets and others are a way to provide finance to these activities so again uh i would say that when we talk about these opportunities one has to assess that these opportunities are basically as i said in the three buckets are you building some solutions or you are providing some service to the sector or you are financing something now in order to do any of these three you need to have the deeper understanding of the space you are talking about you cannot finance nature based solutions without knowing finance and without knowing nature based solutions so one of the hallmark of the climate solution is that that understanding of two or three common themes and bringing it together if you see climate finance pramod is kind of bringing his understanding of the financing the equity debt and structuring to the problems that we face in climate change how he can scale up an ev business by financing how he can support a renewable energy project so he need to understand the play of renewable energy play of ev as well as the role finance can play so in in terms of uh, you know the career opportunities esg uh, is a big because it's a huge number of employment opportunity that we are looking at nature based solution is emerging requires a very different kind of skill set but very critical one uh, carbon finance and blended finance uh i would rather say carbon market is slightly more technical Car uh, you know carbon finance uh, is uh, you know a uh, little bit more like investing into those areas so these are the three but let me just give you another flavor that when we talk about these uh, sectors most people ask that when i can enter that am i ready to enter this spaces or, or what is the leadership role looks like what can we if you look at these uh, you know kind of emerging sectors i have a matrix that i look where you stand on that matrix your expertise starts with uh, you know awareness understanding expertise problem solving and then vision you can have all of that in you and you can be dominant on one part of that so you can think it many way awareness is also the role of people who create awareness about these topics it's a big role in the industry activist journalists they are all kind of coming to this bucket then you are talking about understanding researchers who are writing about that who are researching the things that's another industry emerging within all of this so you can put a layer of esg climate change or whatever you talk about what this layer the third one is that you are talking about expertise the strong expertise can i do debt financing i know to how to finance debt i know how to kind of scale up enterprise then problem solving i i can solve problem by bringing all the expertise together and the last one is vision vision is probably the biggest crisis in the climate space because you are dealing with very very chaotic uh, set of scenarios global policies are changing the knowledge is changing the urgency is changing in this changing scenario you have to have a vision that where you want to go so i would say that people need to start looking at their skill set where they have a strong skill set then start seeing where they are passion and then they move in there great um Santosh, there are a lot of in people who are intrigued and passionate, especially about consulting in this particular space. Would you like to throw some light on that? So, consulting, I think, is a very, very uh, kind of exciting space for those who are uh, really looking to, uh, you know, create solutions which often are not there. So, we play a role in building those spaces, shaping those spaces. I can give an example of. what consulting can do consulting is of many types so i'm not going into the nuances but consulting as guiding somebody to a solution or or kind of providing the solution is all can be part of there especially in the climate change space the two things uh, that are most critical is that a there are a lot of new knowledge that is emerging and it's not available to everyone 
So one role of the consultant is to kind of provide the direction by tapping into those knowledge, emergent, you know, themes, etc. And that you will see that uh, climate change is the hot favorite of every consulting firm. If those who are tracking right now, they can see that in every every consulting firm is announcing that we are investing hundred million dollars, fifty million dollars, two hundred million dollars in talent acquisition to build the practice. Why? Because as the industry is moving from you know status quo to the new direction, you require expertise, you require financing, you require uh, you know all the support services. So. In the climate consulting space, I think it's a uh, uh, it's a mixture of obviously the traditional consulting practices, but the layer that is emerging. You have to be cu curious. You have to understand what is happening around in much more nuances. You have to kind of do the crystal ball gauging so that you can guide, and you have to be very passionate about this space because this is uh, one of the most complex problem that you are trying to solve. And even if you do all of that, there is no guarantee. That you would be able to achieve that, so frustration could be a very easy byproduct of all of that you are doing. You know, climate change is not a very easy problem, so uh, you have to be patient. You have to kind of bring your A game to this thing, because uh, uh, if this problem would have been that easy, we have not been talking about uh, right now. Great. So it looks like there's a lot of uh, opportunity for anybody who wants to build and be an expert in this sector and uh, you know build a leadership career there are opportunities and all um if there are any questions from the audience we'd love to hear from you uh, please put them in your chat box and we'll be happy to answer them so so one thing that i would urge uh, priti uh, since uh, uh, you know we are talking about climate thing there is a big uh, debate about you know what kind of a skill set at the leadership level we require you know and then sometimes climate change is kind of struggling with that problem and one thing uh, you know i would say one of the leading consultant uh, you know uh, uh, orit gedis used to head bain and he told about the consulting leadership so what kind of people uh, or why some consulting sectors or consulting skills are there so i'm just reading from his his, his uh, you know so and this is very recent so he, he quotes as technology globalization geopolitical challenges and competition accelerate the disruption of businesses people are confronted with challenges customs and issues they have never experienced before i find that experts someone with deep knowledge limited to just one area often lack the flexibility needed to adapt to change and can be easily frustrated or worse be completely derailed so he suggests the generalist expert or expert journalist kind of role where you are expert in one area and you have a broad understanding of multiple areas i, I think that's one of the key hallmark of climate consulting mm -hmm. so we have a question from one of our audience members um anisha working with apex institution of farmer producer organizations in india um her message is considering information abundance in the sector what reading material Just give me a second considering information abundance what reading material should one look up to get to get the basic understanding of the carbon market universe okay so i think uh, there are several reports now coming right now so uh, i would suggest that one good source would be to look at the cdm mechanism because carbon market was generated from cdm mechanism so some of the basic principles are there into the unfcc uh, cdm uh, guides but recently if you want to understand the way carbon market works then you need to go to uh, some of the documents on ets you know emission trading systems if you are looking at voluntary carbon market then there are multiple uh, reports coming from uh, you know uh, integrity council for voluntary carbon markets and number of others that you can look for uh, if you are looking at the uh, numbers and where these kind of uh, prices are going up or down you can look at the some of the reports the being produced by world bank so in most of the cases i would urge that go to the world bank open knowledge repository it's called okr and look for the carbon market there are reports that could guide you uh, because those are the best starting point to get a sense of where the carbon market or or what the carbon market uh, is and pramod would you like to add anything to that any reading materials to understand the space 
along with the carbon market i think the youngsters can start understanding the financial dynamics around it which is very crucial for them to understand the whole sector typical financial modeling financial analysis which is standard they should learn that along with the expertise of carbon great um i also wanted to let our audience members know that should you wish to reach out to any of our panel members they would be happy to engage with you via their social media handles it's given in the chat box uh, so feel free to reach out to them and uh, i'm sure they'd be happy to speak with you um there's another chat message hello this is devashree and i'm volunteering with sankal i'm working with um, acuity knowledge partners as an intern in the csr department most opportunities in the csr or sustainability sector demand people with experience over 6 to 7 years in such a situation where can young professionals fit in the sector when they are starting out what can be some of the key skills that they might give them an edge pramod you had entered at some of the skills so why don't you start and then i'll i'll add on to that i think see youngsters i have already talked about those five six key skills analytical communication which is very important if you really want to work into impact space you can join firms like us and uh, start internship or start uh, junior role with us in couple of years you'll get nuances of the whole sector as a whole and what kind of work we are doing and if you really enjoy that work it's become your passion then you can continue to build this career well, thank you pramod for that um well i don't see we have any more questions but uh, like i you know mentioned before please reach out to our panel members via their social media handles and they'll be happy to engage with you um thank you audience for making this an interactive and engaging session as part of our effort to contribute to the impact and development sector we aim to continue uh, this dialogue Wait. Yeah, I think there is one more. Yes, wondering if organization developing new team should focus on building their teams around technical skills or cross-cutting and strategic areas. Okay. Santosh, would you so, like to take? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, you know, uh, Raja, thanks for asking. I think uh, one yes. is as I said that you have to have the strategic vision and a strategic priorities very clear. Uh, you know, you you have to get that right and uh, you know communicate that to entire team. but then once you have done that then you have to identify for that vision what are the kind of technical skills that you need to have in house and some of the skills that you can get from outside so for example if i am building a team of investment banking or climate finance professionals i would rather have the climate finance as a core part of my team but i would not go into building say a climate footprint assessment or climate uh, you know uh, mitigation solution expertise into the team so depending on the play you have towards the strategy you start building the core uh, expertise i can give you a very uh, specific example many of the firms who are working into the esg space uh, they esg uh, you know uh, reporting they do esg audit but a lot of work they outsource because if you want to do an esg footprint analysis of a chemical industry you need a very different kind of skill set so you cannot have all the skills in that there are institutions like sgs they do build the skill that okay we can do analysis of any sector they don't go into reporting but they do the analysis so depending on which lever you have you do that but as i said that since these areas require you to bring multiple skill set it is critical to understand that everybody knows that how this skill fits into that otherwise they will miss the picture santosh thanks can i ask a follow on to that one if that's okay sure, do sure. we have time sure. or yeah i'm sure if we have time priti okay. or okay yeah we'll so okay yeah so santosh uh, why i'm asking this is because we are a non profit organization right so from our perspective it's very difficult to invest resources up front in building a team so would you advise that we and we are, have the strategic approach in the organization to think around the intersection of climate and health so would you suggest that we start with the strategy and initially outsource the services to potential partners before we have enough funding pipeline to actually build a team around the services so would love your thoughts and guidance on that so so i think i would go by staggering the talent resource that i have okay hmm. so i will you know put that which one is the most critical one that i cannot uh, rely on the outside resources right uh, so for example if you are looking at solution design if you are saying that my first approach is to design the solution and then i will get the solution architect the people who think about the solution in house first hmm. now i would get the solution implementation 
to be done by somebody else because that is available there right so mm-hmm. i have to give an example we are working on carbon market similar situation right a uh, carbon market is leveraging its skills on the blockchain leveraging its skills on the policy etc etc i am not going to build a you know blockchain expertise within the team right now i need to see how blockchain applies so somebody who has a top level knowledge of solution design comes in and then i get the blockchain work done by a blockchain firm if i grow and i become big that it becomes my bread and butter then i probably invest into a blockchain team in house but not to start with hope this answers the question you have to find out yeah. which one is very difficult to procure and critical the one which yeah. is easier to procure you can easily go in and get the market yeah. thanks santosh thank you super helpful thanks for the fast in that question um uh, pramod probably you could take this next one um as a leader how do you choose between a high revenue generating but yeah. on impact yeah. driven business opportunity yeah. versus yeah. 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 can everyone put themselves on priti got muted priti got muted you have to unmute yourself oh. i i just muted everyone sorry okay yes okay as a leader how do you choose between a high revenue generating but non impact driven business opportunity versus high impact but less beneficial revenue wise santosh should i take please go ahead sir i i can also contribute my thought on that but yeah please go ahead so of course i think we need to balance it out ultimately we are running an organization which is a uh, kind of uh, balancing the economics as well so obviously we are not going to do anything which is non impact for business we are very clear whatever may be the revenue but wherever we are working on impact side we try to maximize our revenue as well so choice if you ask me impact or no impact we are very clear we don't want to get into no impact business our focus is impact oriented business got it okay i'll move on to the next question we have ashima who works at invest india and her question is what are your thoughts on government intervention to grow the impact investing space so uh, you know let me just respond to that and then pramod can uh, uh, you know uh, so typically the quantum of money required to solve the problem that government is committed to be the climate change or eradicating poverty or uh, making our natural resources more uh, you know productive and safe uh, the government resources would never be enough so government has to put a mechanism where uh, we get all kind of private capital all kind of pools of capital crowded in that now i think this approach is now getting a lot of sense so government is kind of looking at partnering with different kind of institutions getting in the uh, you know uh, private funds to come to so the government plays a huge role in kind of leveraging uh, different kind of pools of capital by policy support by prioritizing certain sectors by de-risking certain sectors so there is no doubt that the government role is one of the most critical one to scale up uh, you know impact investment or impact sector cr b from the finance side or from outcome side pramod you you want to have a word on that i completely agree with santosh's thought about government's role this i mean the kind of investments required in impact world is huge and government cannot put that kind of money all alone so government's role is more of a catalytic role they start they seed the idea they give the seed capital and put the ecosystem around it help the private sector to come in comfortably and then allow the private sector to execute this, that kind of investment in impact space so it, it has to be both uh, government as well as private sector together to have those kind of huge investments in impact work thank you that's insightful pramod um we have debat shri who is curious to know if there is any gap in the cross section of communication research and the impact space which should or can be explored more so you know uh, as i said that impact uh, space is driven by uh, you know the desire to create change and whenever you are looking to create change one uh, bit of change comes from changing people's behavior 
or influencing others to align on a certain path, be the government, corporates, or anyone that. And whenever it comes to uh, aligning somebody to a particular path or changing behavior, communication plays a very critical role. Communication, uh, you know, in fact, in the climate change space, in the development space, communication itself is one of the biggest focus area. The amount of money being spent on, uh, I, I can give you an example of from the different space, ODF, the the problem of uh, sanitation and, and the behaviors that are, uh, are kind of not desirable, changing them requires a huge investment. Uh, so communication becomes a critical, uh, you know, kind of tool to create behavior change, to create influence. So anybody who has a superior communication skills in any sub-segment of communication, not only in the behavior change, but also into communicating topics to the larger mass very clearly, uh, you know, communicating certain scientific things to the common audience in a very uh, simple way is a huge, huge role. So if you are very good at communication, this space is uh, pretty full of opportunity and you should explore. In fact, this space gives you more uh, you know, um, uh, value to apply the communication skill than any one other skills. You can use your communication skill to sell, uh, you know, a bottle of carbonated water, or uh, you can uh, get people to do certain things that you desire. Great. Uh, we have Enjoy um, from Africa. His question is a situation like Kenya, where climate change has hit the normal way of life and hence affecting livelihoods. He's concerned when he evaluates the situation and realize when we have existing policies, but the challenge is much more on the implementation. How can one influence a challenge and ensure the formulated policies are implemented at country and national level? Uh, I, I think uh, this is a typical challenge, not only confined to climate space, but uh, most of the policies that have been kind of... Uh, you know, formulated require a very, very uh, specific type of implementation to be effective. Now, in the climate space, the way we are looking at, we are seeing the role of civil society, role of dedicated institutions, role of uh, academic institutions, role of uh, uh, several other stakeholders, very critical. Most of these stakeholders are not able to kind of contribute or implement the policy the way they, you know, they're expected to primarily because of lack of expertise or lack of understanding. So, most of the countries are kind of building dedicated institutions to build the capacity for these things. I can give an example from India. Uh, India decided to uh, go through a very aggressive target on the solar system and solar energy. And when they started putting that plan, they created a number of institutions, dedicated institutions to just take that vision forward. They created institutions which were financing solar. They created institutions which were testing solar uh, technologies, producing new technology. So I think a simple way is to look at the capacity available within the country for executing those policies and build those capacity. The other is that academic institutions role. And academic institutions play a huge role in getting people uh, into this space and building their capacity. So uh, the government policy will start kind of becoming more effective. You have the right kind of expertise at the grassroots level. Thanks. Um, next question is from Omamo. He is from Nairobi. And he's enjoying the talk. Thanks, Mamo. Concerning the required profile skills, would it be advisable to have an open mind when approaching any sector or limit, or limit your approach based on your background? So, you know, I would it's a slightly different question because uh, you know, uh, there you are uh, not factoring in the ability to transform yourself, learn things, and acquire those skill set and be. It's not a background question, it's a more of a skill question. You can have a five years of uh, experience in certain sectors, but you might not have a skills or you have only like six months of uh, experience and you have that skill. So if you have the right skill, uh, you can always focus on that. But if you don't have that skill and you are trying to build, I would uh, suggest that focus on a transition plan that I have this existing skill that will take me to that kind of role and I build others. An example would be somebody who is trying to be, uh, you know, a uh, investment banker in finance space. So, uh, so investment banker into a climate finance space. They need to have some understanding of the investment banking before they come to the climate. If they are not investment banker and they don't know climate, it's very difficult for them to be an investment banker in climate space. One of them can be, you can say that, okay, I don't know investment banking that much, but I'm very good with climate. You can still find a role into investment banking industry. 
as an expert as part of the team that vetted the deals but if you don't know investment banking you don't know the climate part then it's very difficult to make the transition so you have to have one lever that makes you valuable for that role great thanks antosh um another question is from anvita uh, she is from make a difference and her question is what are some channels through which we can explore the need for communication in the social space i feel like maybe she means uh, the opportunities for communication in the social space priti you can take this trolley so opportunities obviously you know they're they based on career opportunities within the sector and organizations i would imagine that um, you know you keep an eye uh, on all the social platforms as well as job platforms to see uh, you know who's recruiting who's hiring in what uh, areas um i'd also you know encourage you to follow some of the careers website of some organizations which you are really passionate about and you'd like to follow keep an eye and maybe some opportunity pops up right okay i'm just looking if we have any more questions um so amanpreet kaur's question is in india role of planners is being neglected for solving environmental problems where does urban planners or environment planners stands for mitigating climate change impacts your thoughts on the same amanpreet if you are the planner you are in a very high demand or, or you will be in a very high demand in next two years so uh since i dabbled into that space uh, in in my some role uh i came to know that not a single city development plan has factored in the water said or the you know the water catchment areas for that and the result of that you are seeing the urban flood everywhere so with the urban flood and the extreme weather being a norm now there is a huge debate going on that how we change the way we plan our urban settlement urban settlements so you are going to see this uh, you know in a big way that urban planners architects people who have been uh, at the front of uh, city development would start looking at uh, you know uh, roles into climate mitigation climate adaptation more in adaptation uh, because that's much more critical mitigation yes you have to start designing green buildings and making sure that your emission uh, is lesser but adaptation it's a do or die situation literally if you can't design for the flood you are going to struggle um, pramod as a banker uh, you know i can tell you that there are a couple of thing that i learned which is just for the audience that how bankers are going to that two banks are sitting right now on the property residential property that they have on their books as 5 cr per flood because the flood in that area the prices of those five cr properties have gone to one cr so they have lost 80% value just because they could not factor in that this is a water logged area or this could be prone to extreme weather so even the bankers will start looking for that kind of assessment or due diligence that whether this property would lose value because of these kind of poor uh, planning yeah thank you uh, santosh for answering my question so i feel like in india there are only five problems i would just a number like and but all these problem these are recurring in nature for example the floods is one of the biggest problem but it occurs every year so the thing is the government uh, because all the cities are developed in past 100 years but now the population is increasing as so what this is also burdening our infrastructure so i think there is a huge role for the like, government to implement all these plans because every every 5 years the government and the, all the urban local body they do prepare these uh, type of plans also cities prepare uh, prepare transportation plan master plan and other type of infrastructure plan but the thing is the lack of implementation on government sides so i think this is how like we need to uh, look into it. thank you okay um so i think there's one question which says uh, what is your view on partnerships in africa on key leadership trainings dialogue on smart climate and clean energy okay so so before i answer that uh, pramod can answer i think the i i wrote one uh, book suggestion here for uh, uh, some of you might be interested this book talks about that why climate change is ignored 
Uh, if they don't even think about it, why our brains are wired to ignore climate change by George Marshall. This book talks about that why people don't take climate seriously, like the flood happening every year, but they still uh, not act upon that. So uh, probably you'll get some insight and those who are working on communication and behavior change might benefit. Uh, Pramod, you want to talk about the leadership uh, partnership on in Africa uh, or, or some thoughts on that? Yeah, I see next decade is going to be Africa decade. So whole world is going to have focus on Africa. Already there's uh, some uh, developmental action happening in Africa, but more and more commercial action will happen in Africa. So there will be huge requirement of uh, manpower, leadership roles, etc. in Africa. So we as an IntelliCap also started building up uh, footprint in Africa market for last seven years, and uh, it's increasing every year. Right. Um, so local have... leadership. Sorry, but go ahead. Just, just one word. There is a, a lot of discussion happening about the local leadership. In Africa, there is a new concept uh, which most of the DFIs and philanthropic foundation are kind of uh, promoting. It's called local-led economic development. And which means that larger participation of the local institutions, local youth, local leaders in the development discourse or the climate discourse. And I think as they would be looped into many of these uh, leadership roles, I am privy to at least a couple of funds that they decided that they will not invest into Africa if the founding team does not have a native uh, from that country or from that uh, thing. So gradually you will see that this partnership would unlock a lot of leadership uh, opportunities in African uh, countries, including Kenya and others. All right, thanks, Santosh. So there's another question which is asking pretty much uh, what you and Promote spoke about. Uh, what are some specific areas of work within the space that you're excited about? So we spoke about Africa as a region. Anything else you'd like to add? Climate is a hot. Climate is a big thing right now. Agri-tech is a big thing. So across impact space, there is a lot of action. Financials is a big thing, but backed by technology. So we don't see that as a challenge. It's the people's uh, mission, people's uh, passion need to be coming to these sectors. Very important. Yeah. Well, okay, we do have a few minutes. Uh, we can wait for a few more questions if you'd like to send in. Those who are kind of uh, uh, looking at the climate carriers, I would also urge them to to start perfecting one functional skills or one thematic area uh, uh, and be expert in that. Uh, but I think one of the uh, key ask in the climate space is to understand the different nuances of the climate change. Uh, try to understand the bigger picture. The bigger picture is critical. Why somebody is giving cheaper uh, you know, finance to X and A and not to X and B? Why somebody is keen to uh, promote one sector and not another? Uh, why the global countries are coming and working with each other. You know, uh, just for those who are uh, into data and looking at that, the developed countries have committed $100 billion every year in form of grant to be given to the LDCs and developing uh, countries. This $100 billion is every year towards the climate action. Now, once $100 billion that is not seeking return comes to the sector, you need to identify that how you create maximum impact from it. So while we look at, you know, this space, we need to think of all the possible directions. Sure. So just as a reminder, um, for those of you who are interested to know all the great work that IntelliCap is doing and the interesting uh, work in this space, please follow us on our social media pages. You can also follow our careers website to see what opportunities we come up with and uh, to engage with panel members. You know, uh, we've, we've shared their social media handles. Please engage with them, reach out to them. They'll be happy to speak with you. And, and if you are keen to kind of explore opportunities, I think Priti has already given the, uh, uh, our career, uh, you know, uh, things. So we, we are happy to kind of understand uh, just since uh, nobody is asking questions, just to give a plug, uh, I lead the climate practice and I'm always looking for people. Uh, and and uh, we don't have, at IntelliCap, we don't uh, have those orthodoxy that you need to have expertise or, uh, you know, uh, this much of experience in these areas. We focus on certain skills. 
if those skills can create value in the sectors we are working we are very happy to have you on board so when i'm hiring somebody that person doesn't need to be an expert in carbon market because carbon market was not existence in uh, you know uh, for last 10 years in different uh, contexts but if you understand the basics uh, and you have certain skills you can be onboarded uh, uh, again the other part that we are looking at is also to see that how the leadership opportunities are there so we are very keen to have people who have 10 to 15 years of experience uh, come and work in the space and and create uh, value to the larger causes that we have uh, the boundaries of mainstream and others are kind of getting blurred and uh, i would say that the other sectors would be the mainstream jobs this would be the mainstream sector the the way we are looking at everything every board member trying to figure it out what e and s and uh, other dimensions stand for you are in a very very different space altogether at the same time we can add we are looking for long term internships as well yeah well we also aim to continue our dialogue on this topic uh, using the sankal platform and other social media pages so follow us and uh, i'm sure we should be able to hold uh, another session in a few months soon and uh, we'll be happy to engage uh, well with that highly positive note we end this session with a huge thank you to our esteemed audience for making this a very interactive and engaging session and also to our panel members of experts enjoy the rest of the sankal forum thank you